Ladies and gentlemen, let me start by registering my joy to start before you to pay homage to this great man, Pope John Paul II, a pope who really motivated me when I was discerning my vocation, and a pope who really loved Africa. This one, there is no doubt about it. And I feel this great privilege to start here for various reasons. The first one is that I come from Kenya. Kenya is the only country that is visited so far in Africa by popes for four times. John Paul II visited three times, and then Pope Francis visited in 2015. The second reason is that up to last year, I was director of the National Shrine in Nairobi called Resurrection Garden, where the Pope closed the African Synod in 1995. And I can tell you that his memories are still alive and we are preparing in two years' time to make a conference like this one to remember 25 years from the time he visited Kenya. That was the last time. The third reason is at a personal level, I celebrate my birthday on 16th of October, the same day he was celebrating his election as Pope. So every time he could celebrate this election, I was feeling always part of him. And the last reason, I want to pay homage for this country. I am a consulata missionary priest, and for the last 10 years, we have been working here in Poland. I can see two of our missionaries there, those you can see with the most beautiful color there. We come, they come from Africa, one from Ethiopia, the other one from Tanzania. And this was in recognition for the call of Pope John Paul II in his encyclical Redemptor Hominis, no, his encyclical Redemptoris Missio, that the whole church is missionary and we needed to animate it. The role he played in Africa is very significant. First of all, Africa today is having a very high population of Catholics. You can imagine that he's counting, as Professor was saying, 228 millions, which is 17% of the whole population in Africa. And I would like to contest here, or to argue in this my lecture, that this impulse was created by Pope John Paul II. This is the Pope who really visited Africa. I want to hope that in future we'll have another Pope like John Paul II. He made 14 apostolic journeys in Africa. And in these apostolic journeys, he covered 42 of the 55 African countries. Some of the countries like Kenya and Ivory Coast, he visited three times. And then there were those he visited twice, but all the others he visited once. And during these, his visits, he accomplished too many activities. Of course, at the center, there was the pastoral aspect. But there are two significant events that he made in Africa. One was the Eucharistic Congress that was held in Nairobi in 1985. And there, the Pope had the possibility of recognizing how the church in Africa had, uh, had grown. I quote his words, that having such a celebration in Africa, it was a sign of a new stage of maturity and vigor in the life of the young and thriving church in Africa. And then the second important activity or activities that he did in Africa, as somebody presented, were a good number of beatifications he made there. In 1985, he was in Kinshasa to beatify uh, Anuarita Negapeta. In 1988, he was in Lesotho to beatify Gerard. Then he went to Madagascar to beatify Victoria Raswa Manarivo. From there, he went to Reunion, which appertains to France. There he beatified Jean Bernard. And then the last or the penultimate visit he made in Africa in 1998, he was in Nigeria to beatify Iwene Tansi, a who he presented as a good model of reconciliation that Africa needed so much. I don't want to talk much about these apostolic visits because they have been tackled, but Africa still remains grateful to this Pope, to this son of your land, who really loved it and made these visits. 
But by making these visits, I want to introduce another topic that I say that it was an important political organ for the Pope in regards to Africa. But which kind of politics are we talking about? There were politics that were prophetic. He was not in Africa like a meddler. He was a prophet for peace, a prophet for reconciliation. As you know, everywhere, even in the debates that are coming in Europe of the time, every time there is a mention of the word Africa, there are too many issues that they come out there. And John Paul II was very clear right from the beginning of his pontificate. His ideas were actually shaped by a very strong anthropology that he held from the beginning of his pontificate. You can get this one from his first encyclical, Redemptor Hominis, where he is talking about the dignity of the human person. This dignity of the human person created in the image and the likeness of God is the one that made the Pope to appreciate and to embrace people of all cultures. As far as my research is concerned, I did not get any place where the Pope visited before, because, before his election in 1978, any place he visited in Africa. But the moment he became Pope, he was very much induced by this, uh, his first encyclical, and wanted to see the reality of the dignity of the human person realized in Africa. And so the, therefore, these visits of Pope John Paul II, they became an important political organ for lobbying for the rights of the human person in an Africa that was slowly recovering from the problems of colonialism and slowly it was making her own way to maturity. The Pope did this one with a lot of conviction. He made too many interventions. And all these interventions, he was making them so that he can help the Africans, the church in Africa and the Africans themselves to realize the inner capacity they, are, they, they were having. And one of those interventions that I would like to talk about, you can remember about apartheid in South Africa. Right from the beginning, the Pope was very strong with this system that was existing there about racial bar in South Africa. Right from his first visit in Kenya in 1980, he made a very strong speech where he was attacking this system of apartheid. And even when he went to Netherlands five years later, he still talked about this system. As you know, the masters of apartheid, actually, they were from Netherlands. Then something funny happened. In 1988, he had prepared to make a visit to those South African countries, all of them, but he refused to visit, to visit South Africa so long as there was apartheid. But then there was a very bad weather when he was going to Lesotho for the beatification, and he was forced to go and land in South Africa. When he landed in South Africa, he did something that annoyed most of those masters of the apartheid, because he refused to kiss uh, the earth as was his practice the first time he visited a place. But when he visited later, in 1995, when the apartheid system had already fallen, and then there was President Nelson Mandela. He did it, he did it with a lot of uh, enthusiasm, kissing that land, and he declared that South Africa was a new country, actually recognizing the way they call it, a rainbow country, because it is a country with too many, too many people of different cultures. So this one was very important for the Pope. The same thing that he did even when he visited Senegal, he asked for forgiveness for humanity of the time. You know, in Senegal, that is the place where the slaves, some years back, they could pass from there so that they could be distributed in different countries uh, in South America. He called it actually uh, an extermination of humanity and prayed that such kind of a thing would never happen again in Africa. The other role that he played is lobbying for the cancellation of international debts for Africa. At the beginning of the new millennium, he started making this uh, appeal because too many of the African countries were having very heavy debts. And he tried to create an economy talking to the great of the world so that they can have an all-inclusive economy that was thinking about the human person and not only 
about the way man could be misused as many cases that were happening in Africa. And from this one, that is where he will develop even his theology about the preference for the poor. The last document he wrote in, the, in remembering 25 years of his election as Pope, he very much reminded the bishops that they needed to become fathers for the poor. This is the identity of the church, when the church learns to take care of the people who are suffering. But there is another important aspect that his visits made for Africa. And this one is about the formation of consciences of Episcopal conferences in Africa. His anthropology implied a fight for the recognition of human dignity with a special concern for Africa where he exercised a great influence on the local bishops by forming their consciences towards fighting for justice and peace in their troubled societies. The Pope had on many occasions reminded the bishops of Africa about their role in promoting a Christian response to the problems of justice and peace, presenting the social teachings of the church and promoting dialogue and development. Evangelization in Africa was to be carried out through the promotion of justice and peace. His influence can be deduced from the many pastoral letters of the bishops in Africa who were all through quoting his magisterium that was very strong about the issue of social justice. And there is one case that merit to be mentioned here, a country called Malawi, that is between 1992 and 1993. The 1992 campaign criticized the one-party rule of President Kamuzu Banda, becoming the turning point for the democratization in Malawi. The bishops articulated abuses of human rights and the sufferings of the people of Malawi due to the politics of Kamuzu Banda and his style of leadership. This letter was read in all the Catholic churches and it won the hearts of many since it touched on the problems that people are facing. The move was certainly dramatic because the bishops took the risk of throwing the country into a civil war. In fact, the president became very furious and he banned that letter and threatened even to kill some of those bishops. When these bishops went for a liminal visit in 1993, the Pope, praised, the Pope praised them for having devoted a great deal of attention to applying the wisdom in light of Christ's message to their political challenges. And according to Wojtyla, in their evolving political context, such help was especially important in guiding the members of their flock to exercise their rights and duties in the life of the nation. However, we also need to say that not all the confer Episcopal conferences that were able to listen to this voice of Pope John Paul II one case that you very much know about is about the 1994 Rwanda genocide, where, uh, so, sorrow, so sorrowful to mention about it, that even some bishops, some priests, some religious men and women, they were involved in the same genocide. They could not be able to unite people. However, the Pope tried to become, to remain very close to the people of Rwanda and help them to recover from this uh, stigma they were having. Africa is a place, or is a country, with, or is a continent with all these problems that were formed after decolonization. The problem of peace, it is still rampant even today. There is a new politics that started when Agostino Casorali finished his mandate in 1981, and then there was uh, Cardinal Turan, by then Archbishop, when he was in charge of the foreign policy. He started something new that is working with the groups so that they can try to help these uh, upcoming problems in Africa. And it is important to mention the role that was played in that time by the community of Santa Gidio, especially in broking for peace for Mozambique. They were able to talk for almost uh, two years about the possibility of reconciling the two fighting groups, that is Renamo and Frelimo with a method that was, pro that was proposed by Andrea Riccardi, the founder, to leave aside what divides and to start working on that which unites. And this method helped a lot through negotiation and the country was able to regain her peace. And not only here in Mozambique, but in different places, 
uh, the Pope tried to use these groups of uh, lay people so that they could lobby for the good of the Africans. And lastly, but not least, is about the African Synod. This was the first thought that the Pope came uh, with in 1989. After having made too many visits in this continent, he was able to grasp the problems that the continent was facing and he proposed that the bishops of the church in Africa, they needed to put themselves together so that they can reflect about their own church, about their own destiny, as they prepared to usher in the new millennium. And so this synod was held in 1994 with the participation of too many of the African bishops and even uh, the lay people. A central to the theme of evangelization in Africa was the recognition of the centrality of the issues of justice and peace in Africa. For an integral of human development in the line with the anthropology of the Pope, John Paul, the Synod actually argued that it was not possible to proclaim the new commandment of love without promoting justice and peace, the true authentic advan advancement of man. And in fact, these words, justice and peace, they became like the central message in this synod for Africa. Even today, it is not possible to talk about the gospel of Christ in Africa if you don't address the issues of justice and peace. If they try to address too many issues like uh, increasing poverty, urbanization, international debt, the arms trade, the problem of refugees and displaced persons, demographic concerns and threats to the family, the exploitation of women, the spread of AIDS, the survival of the practice of slavery in some countries, and too many issues that were disturbing and even today disturb the church in Africa. That the 1994 Synod did not solve all the problems in Africa was clear by the fact that in November 2004, the same Pope expressed his wish to celebrate the second Synod of bishops having Africa again as the main theme. The point is that the African problem is a complex one because it is normally a game of international politics and interest versus a continent that is struggling to gain her self-mastery so that it can reach to the standard of those who colonized her. Neither Pope John Paul II nor the church could solve these issues in their totality. And the Pope, through his attempts, he never pretended to be capable of solving them. However, by convoking the African Synod, he opened to the whole world the silence discourse regarding Africa and made the Africans realize that the greater part to be played belonged to them. The African theologian, I quote Lawrence Magesa, actually from the beginning of the Synod, he was saying that the importance of the Synod is to make the African Catholics aware of the power they have received through the Spirit of God in Christ to transform the church and the world in accordance with the gospel. Before I make my conclusion, there are some three issues here I would like to, uh, to mention about the Pope, that he has been criticized. Somebody would not like to say something negative about the Pope, but these are criticisms from uh, various scholars. Three issues that probably he had looked is regarding the church and the people of Africa. One issue was about the centrality of polygamy in Africa, which up to today becomes a great, a, a great problem as far as evangelization is concerned. Right from his first visit in 1980, 1980 he tried to talk about the family and children and recognizing also how much Africa holds important the centrality of family. However, he did not open this discourse that up to today disturbed too many countries because when the first missionaries arrived, they were able to reconcile between this practice of uh, polygamy and the newness of Christianity. The second one is on the meaning of celibacy. To Africa, he always prays for the value of, uh, of family and children. Veridone was the conduct of the former Archbishop of Lusaka, you know about him, Emmanuel Miringo. In May 2001, the former prelate started lobbying the dispense to, for the Catholic priest to be dispensed of the obligation of celibacy and pressing that married priests be readmitted back to priestly ministry. To the embarrassment of the entire church at the age of 71, 
Archbishop Emmanuel Miringo married to Maria Sung, a 43-year-old Korean doctor. I'm sorry, what, Professor. We have one minute, okay? One minute. What was more, what was very embarrassing for, for the church is the fact that a bishop got married in another church. Now, what about, uh, the lesson about this conduct of Miringo was the fact that it was the fact that this discussion about celibacy was uh, closed by Pope Paul VI and Pope John Paul II, which up to today uh, divides the church in, in, in Africa. And the last one is about HIV AIDS. Everywhere he went, he proclaimed, of course, about the centrality, uh, uh, about the teaching of the church in the choice of chastity and national methods of family planning. But this problem was very much uh, held, the fact that too many at that time were suffering from HIV and AIDS, and to the point that someone even uh, accused him of having blood of innocent hearts, uh, innocent hearts when he was dying because he did not allow this debate whether it was right to use the contraceptives in Africa. In any case, any due assessment about Pope John Paul II in Africa, this is the best we have ever had, and he opened a silence discourse in the world about, about the church and the Africans. He made Africans to start making sense in a continent that was in a, in a world that was always thinking about Africa in terms of their difficulties. Thank you.